Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the next instalment of OESC in Exile. And we're in Titus chapter 3, and I'm going to read the first eight verses. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. It was Albert Einstein who famously said, women always worry about things that men forget. Men always worry about things women remember. I'm sure there is some truth in this. A frequent pattern of conversation in our home is, I ask my wife in the evening what she's doing the next day. And she will reply, I've, always give, I've already given you the answer to that question. I'm sure you don't listen to a word I say. A lot of men are like me. We need the same thing said over and over again until we compute it. What is true in everyday life is also true in, in the life of faith. Israel suffered from a bad spiritual memory. The psalmist laments in Psalm 106 of Israel's short memory after Yahweh had parted the waters of the Red Sea and given them an escape through from escape route through from slavery through it. But they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold, says the psalmist. Israel's failure to remember Yahweh, Yahweh's hesed, his steadfast love towards her, was perhaps the fundamental reason for her eventual downfall and her subjugation by other nations. No wonder one of the major points of the sermon Moses delivered before Israel entered the promised land was, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. The church minister is said to exercise a teaching ministry in the local church. Of course that's true, but a lot of what a pastor has to say, the flock have heard before. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say than that the church minister exercises a reminding ministry. John Stott puts it like this, So all conscientious Christians, once they have been delivered from the unhealthy lust for originality, take pains to make old truths new and stale truths fresh. The key word of this morning's passage from Titus is found right at the beginning of verse 1. It is the verb to remind. The Greek word is hubenomisko. It means to cause someone to remember, to bring to somebody's remembrance. The same word is used in Luke chapter 22, verse 61, during the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. The cock crowed. It calls Peter to remember the word the Lord Jesus had spoken to him, namely that Peter would deny knowing Jesus three times. Paul, in these eight verses, has three reminders for Titus to give to the Cretan Christians. So this morning I would like us to look at each of Paul's three reminders. Firstly, the reminder of what we once were, verse 3. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. In the previous passage we looked at last week, Paul went into the far-reaching nature of grace. The grace of God was no longer the exclusive privilege of Israel. 
the grace of God had appeared to all kinds of people, to Jew and Gentile, male and female, young and old, slave and freeman. Grace taught its beneficiaries to put off ungodliness and worldly passions and to put on Christ-centred living. Christ taught its beneficiaries to wait for the second epiphany of the Lord Jesus Christ, this time his return in glory. Grace had a very clear goal to create a holy people of God, sanctified and eager to engage in good works. But here in verse 3 of chapter 3, Paul paints a stark picture of the ugly nature of the godless way of life. It's a description of life without grace. This is what life devoid of the grace of God looks like. It's a horror film. Note Paul's use of the first person plural, we. Titus is not to remind these Cretan Christians what they were like in their pagan days. He doesn't remind Titus what he was like before he received Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. No, the we encompasses everyone, the Cretans, Paul's associate Titus, and the great apostle himself. At one time, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved. We lived in malice and envy. Paul puts himself in the same bracket as every other recipient of grace. It is said that cancer is a great leveller. It affects all types of people, whatever their station in life. It is the same with the disease of sin. It too is the great leveller. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, writes Paul in his great manifesto of the Christian faith, his letter to the Romans. Paul, circumcised on the eighth day, Descended from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and zealous for the law of Moses, was just as in need of grace as was a pagan Cretan who had never given the Mosaic law a first thought. Paul then goes on to list seven conditions of the sinner dead in their trespasses and sins. These seven conditions I, for our purposes, have whittled briefly down to five. Firstly, rebellion. The lost sinner is in a state of rebellion against God. His mindset is that of Pharaoh. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? But it's also a state of delusion. The lost sinner is in a world of unreality. He is blind to the reality of God. He can't see the handiwork of God in creation. Or if he has a belief in God, it's a presumptive delusion. Heinrich Heine, the famous 19th century German poet, is reputed to have said on his deathbed, of course God will forgive me. That's his job. But it's also slavery. The lost sinner is in chains. His passions and pleasures have become his prison. He either lives to work or lives to play. At work he thought, at work, he, thought he was indispensable, but in the words of Charles de Gaulle, the graveyard are full of indispensable men. But it's also envy. Envy is an unfortunate byproduct of the self-centred life. Envy, it has been said, is the reverse side of a coin called vanity. Nobody is ever envious of others who in the first place is not vain themselves. The thing about envy is that it is self-destructive. The one who envies inflicts great self-harm. Proverbs 14 verse 30 says that envy rots the bones. Envy makes the heart sick. But it's also antipathy. The sad conclusion of a godless and self-centred life in its worst form is mutual antipathy. People become alienated from one another. Marriages break down. Families break up. True friendship becomes a rarity. The social isolation caused by the lockdown has brought to light just how few many people, especially men, have. Someone may have hundreds of virtual friends on Facebook, but actually only one or two real ones to turn to in times of a crisis. Rebellious, deluded, enslaved, envious and alienated. That was us, writes Paul. That was your condition and my condition, but for the intervention of the grace of God. 
It was pitiful. It was pathetic. It should eliminate any sense of superiority towards unbelievers. It should demolish any sense of pride. We are good Christian people. It should restrain us in our condemnation of a godless world. It should give us pause for thought. We were once godless. We were once captive to self-centered living. It should make us compassionate for those still residing in what was our former condition. Our 21st century Western culture is very concerned about self-esteem and enjoying a positive self-image. We've become obsessed about ourselves, how we look, how others see us, how I feel about myself. Some so-called Christian speakers have bought into this. Here are some of the book titles of the self-improvement. Guru Joyce Mayer. Look great, feel great. 12 keys to enjoying a healthy life now. The confident woman. Start living today boldly and without fear. Eat the cookie. Buy the shoes. Give up yourself. Giving yourself permission to lighten up. But here is the Apostle Paul with an uncompromising dose of truth about the human condition. His aim was not to make people feel good about themselves. He wasn't going to pretend that we are all deep down wonderful people. He wasn't going to gloss over all the evidence to the contrary. He was going to say it as it was. We are hateful and we hate. But the good news that Jesus preached is that we don't need to pretend anymore. We can face our sinfulness in the eye. There is hope. We come secondly then in verses 7, 3 to 7, to the reminder of what we have become. But when the kindness and love of our God, our Saviour, appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Commentators have described these four verses as perhaps the most comprehensive statement of salvation in the New Testament. They typify why Christianity is, in essence, a religion of salvation. People become Christians to be saved from God's righteous judgment. The word grace is only mentioned once in verse 7, but the whole basis of human salvation is grace. Verse 5, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Often you hear famous and successful people say something like this in interviews. I didn't excel at school, but a teacher saw a little spark of talent in me. The teacher really encouraged my gift and made me determined to make the most of it. The teacher played a critical role, but there was raw talent for the teacher to work with. In other words, it was the talent that commended itself. There was a little spark of something within that contributed to this success story. Ill-informed Christians can often think in those terms. God must have seen something in me to save me. There must have been something in me to commend myself to him. There's a song from The Sound of Music with these words. Nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. That's how immature Christians might be tempted to think. In the past, I did something good. God recognised it, therefore he saved me. But the New Testament generally, and verse 5 particularly, contradicts this view. There was absolutely nothing inherently good in you or me to make us acceptable to God. Paul uses the same word as Jesus did in the fifth beatitude, Helios. It was because of his mercy. It was all because of grace. So what have we become through grace? Well, I've picked out four things the Christian has become. Firstly, saved, verse 5, he saved us. There is no self-improvement or self-help book on the market to save us. We can't be our own saviour. Sinners need a saviour outside of themselves to save them. God was our saviour in the person of his son. Jesus was the ultimate manifest manifestation, verse 4, of the kindness and love of God. But the Christian has also been renewed. It's not a patch up of the old, but the birth of the new by the Holy Spirit. It's not a sticking plaster to hold together the cracks in the wall, but the building of a new wall. 
Verse 6 really struck me. The Holy Spirit has been applied to the newborn Christian, not sparingly, but generously, not stingingly, but richly. It's been poured out. The newborn Christian has not been slightly wetted with a weak water pistol. He's been drenched as if standing under a high pressure shower. To those who say, you really must get the blessing. You really must receive the second blessing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I would be inclined to point them to this verse. Paul is obviously talking about Christian conversion when the Holy Spirit is poured out generously on the newborn believer. If this is the case, that every Christian has had the Holy Spirit liberally given to him or her, no one can say, there is nothing I can do for the sake of the kingdom. God has given me nothing. God's word contradicts such a view. No, the Holy Spirit has been poured out generously on you. Of course you are equipped to serve. But we've also been justified. That is to be declared as righteous in God's court of judgment. There are no outstanding charges, no outstanding debts to pay. I once went to a conference put on by our partner in Germany. It was held in the hotel in which the participants were staying. At the end of the conference, I went to the hotel checkout to pay my hotel bill. The lady at the desk informed me there was nothing to pay. My bill had already been paid by our partner and host. That's a picture of justification. Nothing has been charged to the Christian's account. Christ has paid it all. But finally, we have become heirs. The goal of grace is for God to purify for himself a people that are his very own. As such, we are heirs. We have not just been saved from the hopeless state of our former lives. We have been saved for something eternal, eternal life. That is the Christian hope. It is not just about a reformed life on earth. It's about our participation in the eternal life Jesus promised his followers. A reminder of what we once were. A reminder of what we have become. Saved, renewed, justified and heirs. Lastly, verses 1 and 8. A reminder of what we must be. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. Paul has already dealt with the Cretan Christians' responsibilities in the home, in the church, and in the workplace in chapter 2. At the beginning of chapter 3, he now addresses the Cretan Christians' civic responsibilities, the Cretan Christians were not just husbands, wives, and in some cases slaves, they were also citizens. What did they need to be reminded they must be? Paul lists seven attributes. I've condensed these down to three. Firstly, the Cretan Christian must be public spirited. According to ancient Greek historians, Crete was not an easy place to govern. It was a fractious island. Discontent flared up in an instant. Insurrections, murders, internecine wars were commonplace. There was a streak of anti-authoritarianism running through the island. Roman rule was deeply resented. Paul uses the same Greek word hupotasso in verse 1 of chapter 3 as he does in chapter 2 verses 4 and 9. Wives were to be subject to their husband, slaves to their masters, and in the same way so the Christian was to be subject to the state. Against a cultural background of antipathy towards civic authority, the Cretan Christian was to be a model citizen. He was to be law-abiding. He was to obey the laws he disagreed with, as well as the ones he agreed with. More than that, he was to be public-spirited, ready to do whatever is good in the community. Responsible citizenship and a concern for the wider community were to be practical expressions of the Cretan Christian's faith. Apathy is a disease of the 21st century. Lethargy has reached pandemic proportions. Sayanithabin is blown over in a storm. 
After the storm has passed, the bin's contents are strewn all over the pavement. It looks like a dog's breakfast. The apathetic person says, why should I sort out the mess? Let someone else do it. The public-spirited Christian, within reason, sets to it. What other practical public-spirited tasks can the Christian undertake today? Well, surely he can be vaccinated. The rapid development of the vaccine against coronavirus is surely a sign of God's common grace towards mankind. I cannot understand the viewpoint of some Christians who are hostile to the vaccine. In America, especially some highly respected Christian leaders are spreading a great distrust and cynicism among their flock about the vaccine. It's all about money for the pharmaceutical companies. It hasn't been tested sufficiently. Coronavirus is just a hoax. There is no pandemic. Your chances of getting it are minimal. The public spirited Christian gets vaccinated. And by doing so, he or she protects not just themselves, but others too. The public spirited Christian doesn't countenance wild conspiracy theories totally devoid of concrete evidence, merely based on social media gossip. But the Cretan Christian was also to be neighbourly. To speak evil of no one, to avoid quarrelling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. How does a neighbourly Christian behave? Well, according to Paul, he avoids engaging in two negatives and he embraces two positives. The neighbourly Christian doesn't run the reputations down of other people. He's not quarrelsome. He's not like a walking volcano about to erupt at any moment with the least provocation. I read a report the other day of two drivers in a dispute. Neither one would give way to the other. They got out of their respective cars and engaged in an altercation. One of them was filmed holding an axe. Obviously, words were not enough to get across the strength of his feelings. By contrast, the neighbourly Christian is to be gentle showing perfect courtesy towards all people. Two positives. Paul uses the root of the same word, prohutus, as Jesus used in the third beatitude. Blessed are the meek. Meekness, or as it is translated here, gentleness, is the polar opposite of belligerence. Neighbourly Christians don't wield axes, either li literally or verbally. They're not bellicose. What Paul writes at the very end of verse 2 is very striking, to show perfect courtesy towards all people. As evangelical Christians, we compromise a tiny proportion of the total UK population. In the wider church, evangelicals are in the minority. That means that many within the church, and certainly the majority out in the wider world, are going to disagree with our biblically held views. It is not any longer the mainstream view in society that marriage is a contract between a man and a woman. It is not the view even in some branches of the church as the, de as the decision of the recent Methodist conference demonstrates. How is the neighbourly Christian to conduct himself with those he profoundly disagrees with? Well, Paul tells Titus, with perfect courtesy towards all people. We may disagree but we disagree courteously, considerately, and civilly. The New King's James Version puts it like this, showing all humility to all men. It comes back in that sense to Paul's first reminder. Remember what you once were. We have no grounds for being holier than thou. We too were once deceived, enslaved by all manner of passions and pleasures. In any case, to be belligerent in our arguments with those who oppose biblical Christianity is likely to be counterproductive. Courtesy and not boorishness is the, con is the conduct more becoming of an ambassador of Christ and is more likely to commend the gospel to those ignorant of it. Lastly, Paul gives another reminder of what the Christian must be productive. Look at the second half of verse 8 so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. 
practical and productive Christianity is the theme which keeps reoccurring in Titus. The prospective elder must be one who loves what is good. The older women are to teach the younger women what is good. Titus is to set the younger men an example by doing what is good. A defining mark of God's own people is that they are eager to do what is good. Those who have trusted in God devote themselves, therefore, to doing what is good. There is no such thing as armchair Christianity. The Christian doesn't sit in his or her lounge pontificating about the state of the world. The Christian gives of his time, energy and resources in pursuing what is good. The productivity, the good works are not the basis of his or her salvation, but they are certainly the evidence for it. These three reminders then were the things Titus was to stress to the Greek and Christians. A reminder of what they once were. A reminder of what they, by grace, have become. A reminder of what they must be. Paul's three reminders. These are the reminders all Christians need to hear regularly. The first keeps us from pride. The second keeps us thankful. The third keeps us servant-hearted. Amen.